let me welcome Dr. Chaitanya Giri, a renowned space diplomacy and technology specialist in India. And we are very proud of him. And he has done a wonderful job in the field of uh, uh, space diplomacy and technology. He has been there for a very long time. Uh, his resume really impressed me. And uh, I could not uh, uh, resist the temptation of inviting him. And uh, you will uh, all participants uh, just uh, wait how he unfolds, so, you know, the mystery of uh, this uh, space technology, space uh, diplomacy. So far, we had heard of a colonial rule on the earth. But now we are uh, looking for colonial uh, colonization of space also. So this war of, you know, <laughs> um, colonization is being taken from us to space. So how all this is evolving, how India stands in this uh, arena, what India has done right after independence uh, and how uh, science technology, space technology, space diplomacy has been utilized by the uh, Indian governments and all that. So once again, I welcome you, Dr. Giri, to FPRC and this foreign policy school uh, initiative. Uh, it is just to understand the various uh, aspects of Indian foreign policy and Indian diplomacy. And I hope you, our students will really benefit to a great extent. So, once again, thanking you and welcome you. And now you can please uh, continue with your address. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gaur. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to come and, uh, uh, you know, interact with this uh, really nice gathering which uh, you, uh, you've curated and you've gathered of young scholars in international relations. And uh, I, I hope they have varied interests. Uh, in the coming years and days. Uh, so, firstly, to put, I'm here to speak on space diplomacy. Now, uh, diplomacy has uh, already been hyphenated since uh, many, many years now, but only now, only recently, we've started uh, looking at the hyphenations. And uh, the hyphenation is not after diplomacy, but before diplomacy. So uh, diplomacy in that case becomes sort of a, a suffix uh, where you put in a word and then, uh, you know, connect it with diplomacy and you have a whole new sector out there. So for instance, in the past two years, we've seen something as vaccine diplomacy. Uh, we've seen something known as digital diplomacy. We've seen something known as cyber diplomacy. Uh, then so on and so forth. You know, every technology sector or every, you know, sector of economy, uh, since it has started to gather more and more nuances uh, for us, because we, uh, in the past, you know, in large parts of our independence, uh, since 1947, we've been not looking at things uh, holistically and neither have we looked at them uh, in a very nuanced way. But uh, let's say in the past 20 odd years, since uh, the IT boom began in India, when the Indian economy started rising, when our people, you know, got exposed to the world in large numbers, uh, our kids started going out, studying, uh, our, our, you know, friends and family started going out uh, abroad for working. We, 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 we naturally got exposed to, you know, uh, varied pursuits of human humanity and uh, space has been uh, one of it so uh, classically if you look at india space uh, you know pursuits uh, they were restricted to the government to the indian government and uh, india space program is uh, known to be controlled uh, from the very top uh, from the prime minister's office uh, and that itself uh, tells you how important uh, this particular domain is for India. Uh, because uh, the Indian Prime Minister's office uh, has only chosen two departments uh, under their wings. And one is uh, the Department of Space and one is Department of Atomic Energy. So, so we just, just fathom the, the, the importance that uh, these two sectors have for India's, uh, you know, 
national pursuits of progress and prosperity. Uh, but yet at the same time, we've also seen that space is uh, increasingly becoming a concern, uh, a security concern, as well as uh, it is also becoming a new avenue of uh, economic growth. And uh, we, 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 we only now, only in the past two odd years, two to three years started you know, exploring these two aspects. Why do I say that? Why do I say that nothing has happened before uh, 2020? Uh, that's because uh, in 2020, the Indian government uh, initiated something known as the, the space sector reforms. Uh, if you remember, it was uh, a summer day in the month of May. I, I guess it was around 6th of May. We were, we were deep into the first wave of the pandemic. And suddenly one fine afternoon around four o'clock, uh, our finance minister, Nirmala Sitaramanji, comes on the TV and she announces, you know, a BV of uh, various reforms. Uh, and one of it was uh, actually uh, reforms in the space sector, where she said that uh, the government, which has been the sole custodian and sole um, uh, driver of India's space program, is ready to share. Uh, uh, the podium with the private sector. So she welcomed the private sector to come on board and be equitable participants in India's space program. So what does that mean? Number one, our private sector can now build uh, launch vehicles, rockets. Uh, they can build uh, satellites, spacecrafts. They can carry out space-based services. Uh, they can uh, uh, if, if, you know, our, in the next few years, once we cross the five to $10 trillion mark, we'll also start going out in outer space as tourists. So the, the private sector will be again, a, a frontline uh, operator of, of various space tourism activities. Then our private sector can, you know, carry out missions to the moon, to Mars and whatnot. Now, all this sounds really fantastic. Uh, it may sound, you know, uh, spectacular. It may sound, you know, unnecessary. It may sound really unimportant uh, because most of us or most of our diplomatic pursuits or our thoughts are very geopolitical in nature. Uh, we, 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 we think in regions, we think in hemisphere, we think in the, in a global fashion. Uh, but we don't think in terms of politics happening in outer space. So I'll give you an example. What happened today, just today, just a couple of hours ago. The German Space Agency, uh, it's known as DLR, German Aerospace Center. Uh, it released a press, a press statement stating that the German Space Agency hereafter will not cooperate or collaborate with the Russian space agency Roscosmos. Now, when that announcement was made, uh, there, there are quite a few uh, uh, platforms where these two countries are collaborating with each other. Uh, number one, the Germans and the Russians, uh, oh, sorry, the Europeans and the Russians, which includes the Germans, in the European cohort, they were together supposed to go to Mars this year on a mission known as ExoMars. Now, this mission was planned for a very long time. Uh, I mean, it has been under works uh, for the past 18, 19 years. But uh, in the initial phase, the Europeans were eager to go to Mars with the Americans, the, uh, the American Space Agency, NASA. But uh, somewhere around 2011 or 12, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, the Americans pulled out of this particular mission. Then uh, the Germans went to the Russians and asked them whether they could build a lander for them so that the lander can go to Mars and then it can be dropped uh, to the surface of Mars. And uh, the Germans also, the Germans, including the other Europeans, they also requested Russians to provide their launch vehicle, Soyuz, to get the spacecraft uh, uh, from the earth and help it travel to Mars. Now today, 
as we discuss this and after the announcement that was made just a couple of hours ago this mission is completely jeopardized this mission is not happening because the germans have cancelled the russians the russian space agency likewise yesterday uh you know the american space sector is quite vibrant as you all know very well they have a very vibrant space agency nasa they have a very vibrant space uh, private space sector which includes companies like boeing lockheed martin um uh, uh, northrop grumman uh, and all that so many of them many of them. then there are so, so, so many smaller smaller contractors which i don't want to name here but it's very vibrant and it's one of the most uh, potent uh, uh, drivers of global space uh, aspirations uh the russians were helping the americans all this while so for instance there is a series of rockets that americans operate and these rockets are known as the atlas series of rockets uh and atlas series has been used in the past 15 odd years to launch a lot of satellites not only for nasa but also for the us air force and uh, united states strategic command and other defense agencies under pentagon now this particular rocket uh, did not have its own engine the engine used to come from russia the engine's name is rd180 it doesn't mean much but it's a classification given by engineers it's a jargon so rd180 all this while was coming from russia to united states through a us russia partnership public private partnership and this rd180 was being installed on the atlas rockets and this atlas rockets was carrying satellites for all these agencies that i just spoke of yesterday the americans cancelled roscosmos so there is no uh, russian engine going to america anymore so what am i trying to say here i'm trying to say here that uh, you know if you remember the cuban missile crisis immediately after the cuban missile crisis uh, the americans the the eastern bloc and the western uh, nato bloc they they went into a space race so 62 was the missile crisis and from 62 to 69 there was space race which was nothing but the race to the moon the americans won it but the americans uh, paid a very high price for reaching the moon in that short period of time between 64 and uh, 67 1964 and 1967 the americans had pumped nearly 4% of their gdp only in the apollo program imagine 4% of their gdp going to one single mission which was apollo they won but at a high price uh, and later on uh, when the space race subsided both the eastern bloc and the western bloc came together during the detente and they said that look let's bring your apollo and our soyuz together and form something known as a apollo soyuz joint project and that was the beginning of the dampening of the the very hot relations uh, between the two blocs and mind you both these blocs were not Uh, adversaries during the second world war they were friends they were allies they were together it was after winning the war there was a fallout there was a race and this race went on for good uh, 20 odd years uh, leading to this apollo soyuz project as part of the detente and things went well the soviet union collapsed in 1990 and after that it took russia some time to again get up on its feet but all this while space wasn't touched space was always considered as an avenue of cooperation it was part of the hotline it was part of 
the mechanism to calm down tensions uh, there were several movies that i can remember today uh, which actually showed space being uh, you know a point where both these countries or both these factions despite their differences converged but today or in the past two days uh, things seem to be collapsing and this is a turning point for uh, space diplomacy not only for these two factions but also for us because we as indians we are now trying to figure out how to wade uh, the stormy waters that we are seeing uh, coming towards us if you have any questions just you know prompt me ask me immediately I, i'm actually fine with that so coming back to how does this all affect us let's go again back into history when did we start our space program some of you might have seen this new tv series rocket boys uh, which has come on sony live uh, i haven't seen it yet i have seen some snippets but uh, there is a general assumption that indian space program began in 1962 that's not the case the indian space program actually began in 1942 well before 5 years prior to our independence and this happened because of uh, the efforts that were being put by the then group of scientists who well ahead of time well prior to independence started setting up scientific institutions all over india now you guys you come from delhi Uh, you must have seen this place national physical laboratory in delhi uh, it's india's uh, premier metrology institution npl ye jagah hai jahan pe hamare jitne bhi units hote hai units of measurements they are all kept there so units of measuring temperature pressure weights what not it's a premier metrology institution so that was set up in 1945 or actually 1947 uh, the official inauguration was in 47 but the efforts to set up uh, laboratories in physics chemistry began in 1942 under csir uh, there were again group of uh, patriotic scientists like uh, shanti swarup bhatnagar uh, and uh, uh, who were quite ably supported by uh, eminent jurist and statesman like uh, arkut swami mudaliyar and uh, our very own first prime minister jawaharlal nehru uh, then uh, uh, shyam prasad mukherjee who was the first industries minister of india these all people uh, during the early years the in our nation even we are independence our nation was embryonic Uh, they had started setting up these institutions uh, you'll be thrilled to know that even uh, tifr which later went on to spin off uh, bhava atomic research center that also came out in 1945 2 years prior to independence as well as physical research laboratory which is known as uh, the cradle of india space science was set up in 1945 in ahmedabad so ahmedabad mumbai delhi then saha institute of nuclear physics in kolkata these all institutions uh, then raman research institute in bangalore iisc in bangalore they all played a very big role in setting up india's uh, uh, space ambitions uh, in 1954 there was a major announcement made by uh by scientists from all over the world and in this announcement they said that uh, we will be celebrating 1957 and 58 as the international geophysical year and it was a great announcement for that time because the world was uh the world was just coming out of uh, the great war that was fought and this was a avenue where people from the newly formed countries the newly liberated colonies 
were coming together along with uh, the colonial powers and the the victors of the second world war to set up new mechanisms for cooperation 1957 and 1958 uh, are also special because it is because of these efforts of international geophysical year that the soviet union launched sputnik and during this entire year there were several events organized all over the world people from physical research laboratory baba atomic research center saha institute of nuclear physics national physical laboratory in delhi they all were participating in it and the inputs that they were generating or the science they were generating was leading towards setting up of both the department of atomic energy and the department of space which were later uh, established in 1960s and 70s now when we began our space program we were actually in a catch 22 situation the same dilemma that we face today whether to support the russians or whether to support the american bloc we were facing the same dilemma back then but today we are in a much better position we are much more confident uh, we are much more confident about strategic autonomy back then strategic autonomy was only a concept it was only a doctrine but an untested doctrine so what we did was we set up a very mellow tone about our aspirations and uh, when the vision and mission so every organization whenever it is set up it has to express its vision and mission so when uh, when isro was being set up uh, vikram sarabhai was asked what is the vision and mission of this new organization to which he said that we do not uh, we do not intend to compete with the superpowers of the world we want to use space technology for socio economic applications for the betterment of humanity so it was a very mellow a very diplomatic a very serene uh, sounding vision and mission that was announced and uh, we did well actually because uh, up until Uh, 1990s, we had no issues at all. Uh, our launch vehicle program was growing. Uh, our satellite program was growing. The satellites like Rohini, Aryabhat, launch vehicles like SLV, uh, ASLV were all tested. Some of them went uh, uh, performed well. Some of them failed. But uh, in those years, 70s, 80s, up up until 90s. we were helped greatly by uh, both the factions 1984 as you remember uh, was the first time when uh, rakesh sharma uh, took his space flight and that was also a space diplomatic effort because uh, russians or the soviet back then had announced a program known as intercosmos and in that program they had invited many countries astronauts from many countries to come on board their space station uh which they had set up uh, uh the salute the salute series of space stations that they had set up there, there were three salutes and later on came mir if you remember all these names uh, for, no really great for us to go there and you know stay there for uh, you know few hours so all this happened because of Uh, Indo-Russian, Indo-American, Indo-French, Indo-German, Indo-UK diplomacy. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the first big crisis for India's space program came when uh, we were denied cryogenic engine. The arrangement was that the newly formed Russia and its company known as Glav Cosmos, which used to build engines for Russian rockets. uh glav cosmos was supposed to sell us a cryogenic engine and we were supposed to buy it reverse engineer it and uh, rebuild it for our own consumption it was nobody else but biden who prevented this sale the so president biden of today he was the one who was uh, uh 
quite uh, you know he was he was in the center of the storm he was the one who prevented the sale to happen and he was the one who not only sanctioned glav cosmos this company which was selling us but he was the one responsible for sanctioning both isro and drdo for quite a long time the sanctions were relieved only in 2015 and 2016 after the obama modi meetings the two the two or three obama modi meetings that have happened but sanctions did not deter us uh, we we went ahead we made pslv one of the most successful launch vehicles uh, although it does not use cryogenic it uses solid uh, solid and liquid motors but even then pslv became one of the most uh, sought after launch vehicles commercially there we got several customers we understood the space market and uh, during uh, during this period we launched multiple satellites for our own consumption be it remote sensing satellites be it communication satellites and we also launched hundreds of satellites for other countries especially countries from the developing world because we wanted to extend our diplomatic hand we wanted to share our cost effective services uh, for them and mind you many of the uh, satellites that were launched uh, for developing economies came from their universities so these satellites were actually launched at you know nominal cost it did not cost them much but we helped them develop their capabilities because uh, you know to a certain extent we feel responsible uh, towards the developing economies because we have seen the growth we we are now today a newly industrialized nation but there is a lot for us to share with developing economies in africa in latin america in asian region and we've done that um, during this period we had chandrayaan chandrayaan 1 uh, chandrayaan 1 was quite interesting and uh, if you've ever seen the instruments that were carried on chandrayaan 1 the instruments came from developing world as well as developed world so we were carrying our own instruments we were carrying instruments coming from uh, western europe we were carrying instruments from united states and we were also carrying instruments from countries like bulgaria which had just just come out of uh, the shadows of war uh, in that region uh, so uh, we have done a lot for uh, diplomatic purposes then if you come after chandrayaan 1 the, the 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 again the biggest success after that was south asia satellite uh, this is a satellite uh, which was launched to provide communication services Uh, and share communication services with our neighboring countries um, especially afghanistan nepal bhutan sri lanka bangladesh myanmar and in the coming years we are also wanting to share these with uh, these services with countries in africa in the iora in the indian ocean region as well as in the asean region but these are all soft power Uh, pursuits of space diplomacy what has happened in the past one week after the onset of russia ukraine conflict things won't remain the same anymore why do i say that because number one everything has changed our our equations uh, have has changed our ability to meander and our ability to work with both the geopolitical factions are being questioned and they are not being questioned from the russian side because the russians poor russians they are now uh, working solitarily they, they do not have much support poor support at least uh, and the western bloc especially united kingdom canada united states they are now questioning our judgment and uh they are asking us to take sides which certainly we are not going to take but uh, the impact of uh, this sort of uh, arm twisting will happen in the technology sector 
it will happen in the atomic energy sector it will happen in the space sector because we have we have experienced the same in the past where when russia broke down and when it used to be our closest uh, ally offering us space technologies uh, our arms were twisted our agencies were sanctioned and uh, we should anticipate something of that sort happening to our agencies once again not not as harshly but there will be some not as punitively but there will be some measures that will be taken to deter us and impact us so where are we in all this great power competition space is about great power competition although we have uh, in the past uh, you know 50 years of our space pursuits we 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 acted mellow we we been you know uh, reticent we been pragmatic uh, we we haven't uh, uh, just beated our uh, ambitions and we didn't have any resources to do that chess beating but today we do have resources so what has what is being planned in the next few years number one russian cooperation for us is necessary because they are helping us with uh, the indian human space flight program gaganyaan which is supposed to be launched uh, sometime next year in 2023 will or is happening because of uh, tremendous inputs coming from russia although i won't say that russia is the only country helping us with gaganyaan we we are also getting some assistance from france uh, but that that aspect of indo russian partnership will be questioned and we may also have to sever that partnership or cut it off to a great extent if not fully number 2 there is a rising china in our neighborhood a rising china which is also a rising space power china today has been to the moon 6 to 7 times we have only been there twice china has recently uh, landed a rover on mars china has a full fledged modular space station orbiting uh in the lower earth orbit china has tremendous capacities in industry 4.0 especially quantum communications and it has already uh demonstrated uh sending encrypted signals from beijing to vienna whereas if you've seen the news isro just demonstrated the same but it could demonstrated on a scale of a kilometer or so just a couple of weeks ago drdo demonstrated the same uh quantum communication transmission of encrypted signals uh at a distance of around 100 meters whereas the chinese have transmitted encrypted signals intercontinentally so the bottom line is it is the chinese economy the strength of the chinese economy that has helped it to get a new space power status and if we have to grow economically if we have to cross the 5 10 trillion dollar mark that we are anticipating in this decade space will be one of the most important domains for us it is important not only for uh scientific missions that we just spoke of but also for defense purposes also for commercial purposes we it is very likely that if we continue with strategic autonomy doctrine we will become again part of a non aligned movement but luckily uh this time the non aligned movement will be uh, having some consequential nations in it and this is my anticipation uh i believe india will be supported by a band of independent minded nations uh like uh, uae which you've seen in the recent case has abstained from voting despite being a close strategic partner of the united states it has abstained its vote on ukraine so uae being one israel 
Saudi Arabia, uh, France, and then if you look out in uh, the ASEAN region, Indonesia, and Philippines, uh, to whom we've just sold the BrahMos missile. So there will be a band of countries who wouldn't want to side with Russians openly or Americans openly, but they'll want to take a middle ground. And uh, there is a very good chance that the new non-aligned movement will not only be an ideological grouping as the earlier non-aligned movement was, but it will be a, the third alternative to these two groups. Why do I say that? We've seen, we, uh, uh, like for instance, when I said uh, Germans cancelling the Russian space agency, what does that mean? It means that American, uh, uh, so United States is bringing a band of countries under its umbrella and they are together wanting to share technical resources, human resources and monetary resources to build a common space program. The Americans call it the Artemis Accords. So they created an agreement. This happened during uh, the Trump administration uh, in his uh, last or second last month around October of 2020. Artemis Accords was tabled and the Americans were able to attract partnership of Japan, South Korea, Italy, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UAE, and a few other nations. Likewise, the Chinese and Russians are now wanting to partner each other. And this will be, uh, this, uh, this will, I mean, the Chinese will take Russia under its wing because the Europe and the United States are canceling it. So it will become uh, imperative for Russia to ally with uh, China in strategic sectors, including space. So both these countries have agreed to launch something known as International Lunar Research Station. Their plan is to set up a space station on the surface of the moon as well as a space station that will orbit the moon. And they want to build a logistics network that will connect the earth to the moon. Logistics network means transportation as well as communication systems. Like Artemis is exactly the same. Under the Artemis Accords, these countries are wanting to pool all these resources so that they go together to the moon and set up bases there. Now, this is the new form of colonization. If you are aware of uh, 14th century or 13th century history of Europe, this is how all the colonial countries began. So you must, you must look at the treaties that were signed between the Spanish and the Portuguese, where the treaty was uh, uh, overseen by uh, the Pope. It was overseen by Vatican under a papal bull. And in this treaty, it was said that west of Atlantic will be the Spanish territory up to a certain meridian and east of it will be Portuguese territory. So if you look at uh, the entire American continents, you'll find that the Spanish were in North America, in today's America, in Mexico, and in all the Eastern South American countries. So from right from uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, and the only Portuguese country in South America, which is Brazil, was east of the meridian that was chosen in that agreement between the then Portuguese and the then uh, Spanish. And if you look at the Portuguese, what did they do? They came up to, they first came up to Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. They tested the entire logistics line. And then once they were confident how to reach Cape of Good Hope, in the second trip came uh, Vasco da Gama, who later continued the travel towards India. 
whereas for the uh, for the spanish uh, the person who wanted to discover india was ferdinand magellan and magellan then went south he crossed the uh, the, the straits of magellan which are now called as straits of magellan then he went to philippines where he died during the skirmish so the europeans are known to divide the world and this has been part of their history it is happening the same is happening right now they are wanting to divide the world between the slavic the slavic world that constitutes of russia and even ukraine is part of that and the the world that uh, constitutes the rest of europe and that's why even when uh, lavrov says the next world war will be fought with nuclear weapons we must be sure that uh, we are not part of that war the first two world wars at least for the british and the allied forces were fought because of uh, indian soldiers none of the indian soldiers are going to fight their wars anymore so it will be difficult for them to execute such wars with people not joining them uh, at least from the indian subcontinent but having said that uh, we will see similar colonization happening in outer space the only good part of that colonization is number one there won't be any human displacement or tragedies as has happened in africa or in asia or in here in india because there is nobody living out there but it might be the case that all the junior partners that are joining these two blocks their economies might get drained so like for instance if uh, there is a small country which is compelled so romania romania just yesterday signed the artemis accords so it is now part of the american group bank so if the entire pursuit of going to the moon becomes too ambitious it depends on the wisdom of the national leaders whether this agreement or this accord brings economic or socio economic development to them and if they are not wise enough such kind of agreements or such kind of mega projects might drain out their economies the same way as uh, the chinese belt and road has done so actually there is no apparent distinction between the motives of the russo chinese bloc and the western bloc anymore aur yahan pe hame bahut aane wale samay mein 10 saalon mein 15 saalon mein bahut sambhal ke chalna padega in terms of space we are definitely wanting to go atmanirbhar and we are definitely wanting to get a healthy share of the global market so that we provide them the necessary services so we want a share in the developing economies uh, especially in countries that are frustrated with china due to the bri exploitation so that will be a natural market for us but over there we'll have to compete with united states and its allies so things are going to get convoluted now i wouldn't have said this if we, i would have lectured you or this interaction would have happened last week or 10 days ago but pichle ek hafte mein bahut kuch badla hai at least for the space sector i look at the smaller sector i look at the bigger things as well but mere sector mein kafi ghamasan hone wala hai और मेरा सेक्टर बहुत स्ट्रेटेजिक है एंड आई स्टार्टेड बाय सेइंग दैट इट इज द प्राइम मिनिस्टर्स ऑफिस दैट लुक्स आफ्टर इट दे आर नॉट गोइंग टू गिव द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ स्पेस अवे टू एनी अदर मिनिस्ट्री एंड दिस इज द वेरी रीजन द स्ट्रेटेजिक इंपॉर्टेंस ऑफ स्पेस इट इज ओनली गोइंग टू ग्रो हियर आफ्टर सो 
I land over here. Sir, uh, up mute pe hai. Uh, I was so engrossed that uh, <laughs> I forgot about it. Uh, I just <clears throat> said that uh, I was just listening to uh, like a student. I was reminded of my student days when I used to listen to my teachers. I mean, with the same, you know, keenness and with this uh, rapt attention. So I was almost lost in your lecture and all that. So before uh, I have some queries, but uh, uh, let the participant uh, first uh, read the questions. And uh, there is a surprise for you, a great fan of yours who is uh, working on uh, studying on uh, space, uh, you know, uh, technology, space diplomacy is here. I invited him. He was one of our former interns. So I couldn't forget to invite him, although he's not a part of this uh, program and all that. So he will also have some query uh, because uh, he, be he belongs to your fraternity. So now the uh, Participants, please uh, be quick, introduce yourself and uh, put your questions. Come on. Uh, good evening, sir. First of all, thank you so much for this wonderful session. My name is Pranjal and, and I'm doing a master's in IF from JNU. So, so I have two questions. My uh, first question is, in the last two world wars, battles were unfounded across the domain of land, air and sea. Now, with the upcoming uh, of latest space technologies and with the increasing presence of nation states in space, do you think that space will be emerged as a major domain in future warfare? Yeah, I mean, space will not emerge, it has already emerged. So, if you look at again, again, I'll give you the recent examples. Ukraine wanted access to geospatial images. And it doesn't have satellites of its own. It had to depend on uh, Western countries to provide them the necessary geospatial images so that they can track the troop movements that are coming towards Kharkiv and towards Kiev. So, lo and behold, you have that. It's already in use. Number two, they were looking for satellite communications. Uh, because while the Russians were coming in and storming the cities, they were pulling down the telecom infrastructure because they did not want the opponents to get access to real-time communication services because real-time communication services can deter uh, troop movement. The troop movements uh, or the troops can get attacked. So for that, they pulled down all the terrestrial telecom infrastructure, the Russians. As a result, the Ukrainians went to Elon Musk and asked him to supply uh, services from Starlink satellites. Starlink satellites to upar hai, akash mein hai aapke. They wanted the ground controls, the ground stations. And Elon Musk was... Uh, quite happy to readily provide the ground stations for Ukrainians so that they have seamless internet connectivity. Now, Elon Musk couldn't have operated entirely on his own without any Ashirwad coming from Pentagon. So, space is already here. It's just that we haven't fought a war yet with uh, space technologies in hand. The last war that we fought Kargil, we did not have geospatial images, high resolution geospatial images. Uh, because see, Kargil was fought in the Himalayas. Himalayas is a very rough terrain. The climate is also rough. The cloud cover is high. Uh, on the western side of uh, the Himalayas, especially in the Kargil belt, in the Kargil in the Srinagar Valley, or in the POK region, it's very cloudy, even in the summer times. Whereas if you go east of uh, uh, Himalayas on the Ladakh plateau, you don't get that much cloud cover and you can easily see the ground. So back then we were asking for some geospatial images from United States. We were wanting to have pinpointed 
to seek pinpointed locations of uh, the terrorists that was sitting on uh, top or the pag army that was sitting on some of vital positions but we were not given the data as readily the ukrainians have received it today to yahan pe bhi politics hai yahan pe bhi rajneeti hai hame wo diya nahi gaya tha aur wo cheez humne kafi dhyan mein rakhi aur humne ye thaan liya tha ki aane wale samay mein hum kisi ke upar dependent nahi rahenge aaj ke samay mein we have a very healthy space infrastructure that is providing us imagery that is providing us high resolution imagery uh, world class and it is also providing us uh, communication services so space hum humko uski kami kargil ke waqt hi mehsoos hui thi but today it has become indispensable so we are not future looking it is already part of the battlefield systems और मैं एक बात तो कहना भूल गया कि 2018 के समर में मतलब आज से कितने चार साल पहले जब सीडीएस की पोजीशन बन रही थी चीफ ऑफ डिफेंस स्टाफ की पोजीशन बन रही थी सीडीएस की पोजीशन के नीचे तीन नए आर्म फोर्सेस के आर्म्स बनाए गए उसमें से एक है डिफेंस साइबर एजेंसी एक है डिफेंस स्पेस एजेंसी और तीसरा है आर्म फोर्सेस स्पेशल ऑपरेशंस डिवीजन नाउ दे ऑल वर्क इन सीक्रेसी मैं इतना ही कह सकता हूं ओके सर थैंक यू सर माय सेकंड क्वेश्चन इज इफ आई एम नॉट फ्रॉम द रशिया टेस्ट इट इज एंटी सैटेलाइट अटैक्स बाय डिस्ट्रॉइंग इट्स नेक्स्ट सैटेलाइट लास्ट ईयर इन नवंबर सो व्हाट आर द इंप्लिकेशंस ऑफ सच एक्शंस इन द ओवरऑल स्पेस ऑर्गेनाइजेशन रेस व्हिच इज गोइंग ऑन अमंग नेचर पावर्स आल्सो सर कैन यू इलैबोरेट मोर ऑन द चेक्स एंड बैलेंसेस व्हिच इज इन प्लेस टू काउंटर सच ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ऑफ स्पेस देखिए व्हेन एजेंसीज व्हेन सिविलियन स्पेस एजेंसी स्टार्ट कैंसिलिंग ईच अदर जाओ मैं आपके साथ काम नहीं करता जाओ हम आपके साथ काम नहीं करते दिस इज एक्चुअली इकोनॉमिक वेपनाइजेशन ऑफ स्पेस what you are talking about is uh, weaponization of space with kinetic projectiles with with missile like uh, you know weapon systems so space has already been weaponized and why just russians uh, asat has been tested by chinese asat has been tested by americans and we've also tested it asat is uh it is another avatar of nuclear deterrence it hasn't been accorded that title because there are not many people in this community to speak on these subjects but asat is a deterrent weapon a weapon that should not be used so with russians testing it uh, uh, it is quite evident that they were they had started sending out signals to nato that look we are now prepared to fight a war at least in the bordering regions yes next question come on introduce yourself and put the question Come on. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is Akhilesh Duvedi, a uh, doctoral student uh, from CSJMU Kanpur University. And so I am working on this area, like a uh, role of science and technology on modern world there. So I have got a question here, like, uh, so have India, India's position in multilateral forums on how the space domain should be governed? Change with the country's new focus on military capabilities. <coughs> so it changed a little bit after Mission Shakti. Yes. Uh, so when Mission Shakti happened, there was international reaction to it, and the strongest reaction came from uh, United States, and the most pacifying reaction also came from United States. Hmm. Does that mean what happened? 
इसका मतलब ये हुआ कि उस समय के जो नासा के एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर थे चीफ एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर थे जिम ब्रिंडनस्टाइन जिम ब्रिंडनस्टाइन केम थ्रैशिंग ऑन इंडिया एंड सेइंग दैट लुक यू आर क्रिएटिंग मैसिव अमाउंट्स ऑफ स्पेस डेब्री एंड दिस डेब्री इज हार्मिंग सैटेलाइट्स ऑफ अदर कंट्रीज सो दिस इज नॉट बैड सो दिस वाज सॉर्ट ऑफ हिज और और हिज स्टांस not his personal stance but the stance of uh, united states that he was representing whereas a contradictory stance came from department of state mm. so department of state said that it understands india's security concerns mm. and uh, a uh, yeah that's it that's it it understands india's security concerns and by saying that it was meaning china okay thank you sir so uh we started making waves uh, after mission shakti although we did not get much time because mission shakti ke baad we just had one year for a solid space uh, multilateral in the past two years there was there was a lot of space multilateral meetings but most of them were uh, online and um, many a times these discussions happen in the sidelines of the meetings and they haven't happened yet although my my hunch is that once in the post pandemic uh, period once all the multilateral meetings resume physically with physical presence of um, uh, representatives um, and now that this entire uh, war has happened uh, there will be a lot of pressure coming from that front on india in multilateral forums at least in multilateral forums where uh, these blocks are presiding over so let's say for instance and most of these presidencies or chairmanships uh, are time bound they last for a year or so but whenever they get an opportunity they will come at us heavily yes next question yes, sir. Yes, yes. Come on, come on. Be quick. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Hi. I am Akriti Verma, and I am pursuing masters in international relations. Uh, so I would just like to know that uh, can you please throw some light how the Indian space program, you know, has changed over the years, and uh, what, like, uh, how you see it in the you know upcoming decade or like next five to seven years. unfortunately it did not change much how is that mo- modified or we can say altered no it hasn't altered it hasn't modified much because um it had set goals back when the space program was established and uh, most of the goals uh, have yet not been uh, fulfilled like for instance human space flight was a goal back then we are just beginning to fulfill it then for instance a uh, super heavy lift launch which is launching something which is uh, around uh, 5 to 10 tons is yet not possible the heaviest that we can launch right now is 3 ton 3000 kg so that is yet to be fulfilled uh, but uh, again in the past 5 uh, to 6 years when uh, Uh, the world started acknowledging that we are now entering the fourth industrial revolution the fourth industrial age uh, that has uh, that has created some waves in the indian space program so we are now quite serious about the fact that we can't be continuing with the technologies that we worked with all these years so let's say for example a pslv which was carrying hundreds of satellites in one go and pslv can carry up to 3000 kg uh, uh, sorry up to 2000 kg so it is not enough we want much smaller rockets we want rockets that can carry let's say around 100 kg to 500 kg in in the lower orbit so we want something like that we want satellites that can work on quantum communications quantum communications wasn't envisaged back when the space program began so these are all changes these are all you know uh revolutionary changes in technology 
and this is something that isro wasn't anticipating to happen so soon and uh, the isro or department of space has been quite resisting in, in terms of uh, assimilating new technologies um, unlike united states or china or europe where they were quite open to working with the industry for a long time isro was working entirely on its own and most of the output was coming from government outlays outlays coming from the finance ministry uh, and uh, with the limited staff that it works with aap sochiye ki bharat mein kareeban 1.4 billion population hai 1.4 billion population mein se agar sirf kuch chand hazar logon ka hi istemal agar space pursuits ke liye kiya jaye that means we are not tapping talent that is residing in our country we are not tapping all the talent that is residing in our country only those who can make or only those who can enter the gates of isro or department of space are contributing to india space program now that's not wise why should you let the unused talent remain unused and that's for that very reason the space reforms are quite uh, revolutionary uh, because all those who are unable to work with isro directly will also be engaged if they get employment opportunities in the private sector so let's say uh, tomorrow in the next uh, few months a pslv that is entirely built by uh, companies like lnt okay or godrej aerospace or walchand nagar so the all these companies are going to form a consortium and build rockets for isro so all those people who have no experience of working with isro will get jobs so it is exactly that so creating opportunities so that employment is generated for people to work in the space sector and yet at the same time it also gives you economic uh, catapult so the same way america works america american space program is not entirely dependent on nasa uh, most of it is quite well distributed in its private sector including silicon valley so very similarly you need not be in isro to work for india space program or india space uh, aspirations you can be working anywhere in delhi or anywhere in uh, let's say pune or nagpur a company based out of any of these cities and still work for the space program so this is this is a monumental change that is happening yes next question thank you sir uh, so just a second i also have another question i would just like to know your views on you know uh, like abhi the crisis which is going on to uh, elon musk sent a uh, starlink satellite to ukraine so that there will be no internet uh, cut out so could you please throw a light upon that See, this is going to happen uh, there is a very good chance that uh, ukraine may get divided into two countries one will go entirely into the russian bloc the russian speaking uh, segment of the country will go into russia or become a de facto state whereas the nation which will consist largely of ukrainian uh, nationals will will side with uh, nato and all that is available at nato's disposal will be offered to them to fight this russian bloc so elon musk is no different we may we may assume or we we perceive elon musk as an independent person with a independent foresight um he has that i don't deny that but yet again elon musk is uh you know he works very closely with uh, pentagon he wouldn't have grown to this stature without assistance from pentagon so you know acts like these they they consolidate Uh, his image as a pentagon person thank you sir and thank you for the wonderful talk yes next come on don't detain dr giri for long 
Put your questions to him. Uh, uh, Dr. Grip, uh, I was a query. Uh, yes, yes, just like just like these students. Uh, we have heard of this uh, uh, space uh, tourism. Can uh, Indians have this luxury? Can they afford it? Okay, so space tourism is actually a, a term that is creating disillusions. It won't be exactly tourism, at least in the foreseeable future. Because uh, apart from a joyride in low gravity, there's nothing much to watch or see in outer space. Or, I mean, you can see the Earth using virtual reality glasses, Oculus glasses, very well, sitting here on Earth. You don't need to be out there. So going out in outer space, uh, just to experience microgravity, I don't think that will be a lucrative business proposal. What is going to happen very soon, and there are already plans for it, is that commercial space stations are coming up. There is an American company known as Axiom Space. So after this international space station comes down, maybe in the next six years or so, Axiom Space will rise and it will set the world's first commercial space station. And it will invite companies to do their research in microgravity environments or in space environments and rent their space for this kind of research activities. So companies from the pharmaceutical sector, uh, from the semiconductors industry, materials industry, electronics industry, you know, all those who want to develop new novel materials for novel applications, um, they would go up there, rent the space out, use it for, let's say, a few days or a few months, and then come back. That is the industrial tourism that what I'm seeing. It's, it's more like uh, work travel. Joyride hunge, like in joyride will be mostly restricted to uh, upper atmosphere, where you'll have aeroplanes going up at a steep uh, incline and then coming down again on a steep decline. And in those few seconds or few minutes, you'll be able to experience microgravity. This is already happening on a, on a re research and development scale, but it will be offered to public to experience uh, uh, microgravity. That can be slotted something as adventure tourism, but nothing more than that. Because this industry cannot sustain, the so-called space tourism cannot sustain on a uh, few billionaires. So, ये जो भ्रांति फैली हुई है कि अमीर लोग जाएंगे, अमीर लोग वहाँ पे they'll get their joyride and then they'll come back. That's not going to happen, at least anytime soon. Uh, you are right to 